Okay, it looks like just about everyone is seated. So I'm going to get started on an introduction. Um, I'm extremely excited to introduce our guest lecturer today for this colloquium series, the third in the series. Um, the speaker for today is uh, Dr. Christopher Donahue, and he is a historian at NHGRI. I have worked with Chris for five years, and during that time, I've been extremely impressed by his knowledge on a wide range of subjects, um, which include historical and present manifestations of eugenics, scientific racism, ableism, heteronormativity, and their complex associations to contemporary genomics. Much of the operations of the Office of Communications, which I direct at NHGRI, incorporates Christopher's work into much of our programming. Using the history of genetics, genomics, and being transparent about the history of eugenics and its ties to the history of genetics are absolutely foundational to everything we communicate about now. Because much of what we do is about understanding how genetics and genomics can be misappropriated and misused um, and misapplied, often quite unscientifically uh, throughout history. And so that we can be more mindful now to avoid those same mistakes. Christopher is extremely well published. Um, he's a very prolific writer in addition to being an excellent researcher. Uh, he's also conducted more than 60 oral histories for the Institute. He co-manages the History of Genomics program. He will tell you more about himself and his history in his talk, so I won't go into too much more detail, but I will just tease you to say that much of his talk today is actually original research that he's conducted over the last few years that will be incorporated into future book and other manuscript projects. So you're getting uh, a sneak preview of some very exciting original historical research. And now I will turn it over to you, Christopher. Thanks very much, Sarah, and, and thank. Uh, I want to thank all of you for the uh, for the opportunity to present here today on this very important uh, topic. Um, and to echo Sarah's points, particularly after the first Q&A, a lot of the material that's presented on the uh, justification of eugenics and involuntary sterilization um, after the Second World War and also voluntary sterilization after the Second World War and the role of the NIH is part of a new uh, book manuscript. So um, some of the questions are not answered uh, to my satisfaction yet, but I wanna make some present day connections that are uh, of importance. This is just a general disclaimer that the opinions are, are really mine alone, and that goes for this presentation and any ensuing discussion. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about my career first, and I, I just want to emphasize that um, uh, or start with the, the fact that I'm a Washington, D.C., Chevy Chase, Maryland, uh, born and raised, and this is a picture of me uh, in the late in the early 1980s, on the first day that uh, my parents and I and my family moved into our house in uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland. Interestingly enough, um, although not at the same time, I actually grew up in the same uh, neighborhood as, as Maynard Olson, who was one of the architects, or remains one of the architects of the Human Genome Project and uh, contemporary genomics. We actually uh, uh, sort of uh, existed in the, in the same circles, just not at the same time. So for high school, I went to a, a Jesuit high school called Gonzaga College High School uh, in downtown Washington, D.C., near right near Union Station. Um, the high school has actually been in existence since 1821, and the reason that there is a, a college in the name is that up until, I think, right before the First World War, you actually had the ability of getting a college degree from, from my high school. Um, and there's a very interesting picture of, uh, at that point, I think it was Justice um, Taft, uh, the former president presiding, you know, in the early 20th century over the centennial of, uh, of my school or thereabouts. So my school has a very rich history, but I, I've stayed local. So this is a picture of, unfortunately, the uh, renovated uh, Hertzler 
undergraduate reading room, which was one of the, the first, uh, which was the only sort of 24 hour study space uh, available to undergraduates at my campus when I was at Hopkins, where I was mostly a um, history and philosophy major. And I, I focused in terms of philosophy on moral philosophy and, and what we would basically call uh, bioethics. Um, and, in, and in history, I really focused on uh, history of ideas, history of science, and was, but spent an incredible amount of um, time in this uh, undergraduate 24-hour reading room. Uh, what is not shown here is the, the big uh, receiving desk uh, which actually um, used to be the the undergraduate bar, uh, and that was an interesting feature of the old uh, of the sort of the old space. But the, I wasn't able to find a picture. So after that, I went to the University of Maryland for my PhD work, um, and my master's degree thesis was a very, um, I think, at that point non-traditional uh, uh, sort of controversial thesis because it was the the first um, and I think really the uh, still the only really exhaustive uh, discussion of of how um, uh, medical literature, particularly before the Second World War, was used to justify slavery and also used used to in in many cases even justify sort of keeping individuals enslaved. Um, and this was very controversial at the time because it was it was seen as a project where, in essence, to to analyze this a bit too much would be to sort of it was better to basically see this as a kind of uh, a vestige of of racism and irrationalism, and it, it didn't need much of an explanation. And 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 that period of time was was passed. And um, I had some very supportive uh, individuals for my master's degree work, including. Ira Berlin, uh, who has passed away, who was one of the, the key uh, uh, real architects of uh, modern um, uh, discussions of Atlant slavery in the Atlantic. Um, all of this was deeply ironic, too, because um, the history department at the University of Maryland is housed in Francis Scott Key Hall. And Francis Scott Key, as, as many of you might know, actually uh, was uh, had a significant uh, 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 actually owned slaves and was really sort of a, a pro-slavery individual. Um, so there was a there was a deeply felt uh, discomfort of of working in this building. Um, and there has been an effort to rename it, but that effort, unfortunately, I think has has stalled. Um, after some years, I decided that um, uh, while American history and history of medicine was uh, really important and uh, a significant um, uh, a significant interest of mine, what I really wanted to do was was study more contemporary biology and genetics. Um, and here, the decisive influence was a was a scholar named um, uh, Jeffrey Herf, uh, who. I think is one of the most significant uh, scholars of, of 20th century eugenics, 20th century Nazi Germany, and in particular taking um, ideologies like, like anti-Semitism and, and far-right ideology and how it interacts with science and how science is weaponized very, very, uh, in, uh, very, very seriously. And his book uh, here, uh, Reactionary Modernism, first published in 1984, was the first book to really look at Nazi Germany and look at how the Nazi German ideology in, impacted science and genetics and even things like engineering and could be could be traced to long sort of simmering ideas in the 19th century. So it's a, it's a masterful book. And, and Jeffrey's, and all of this too, was deeply archival using sources that had never been touched before. And that deeply influenced me. Um, uh, the second book is uh, was published in 2008, and uh, Jeffrey's published other things, but these two are the most important for me. And The Jewish Enemy was like reactionary modernism insofar as it, it used these sort of untapped sources, and then it essentially argued that... Um, um, uh, that the Nazi Germany, uh, in in sort of developing its its 
virile and barbaric anti-Semitism used some of the most modern uh, communications tools available. Um, and, and Jeffrey in particular was, was deeply significant for my dissertation work, which was on, in particular, the close interactions between population genetics and eugenics af uh, after the Second World War and has been supportive of me ever since. So two other mentors that were extremely important for my pedagogy were uh, John Lampe, uh, who really uh, taught me to, to think about Eastern Europe and connections, uh, uh, particularly across the 20th century. And this is you know, very significant for my, the work that I do now. And also Herman Belts, who recently passed away, sadly. And Herman, if you can't see uh, behind him, is is uh, on the right is actually sitting in the Supreme Court chambers, and that's the only time that they have led in cameras, and that was for his Reconstruction History Conference. And Herman, more than anything else, uh, this uh, really uh, in, uh, inspired in me a, a, a deep reverence for archives and sources and rigor. So. Transformational was my archive work. Um, I think this was in the summer of 2007 and 2008 um, at the American Institute of Physics Center for the History of Physics. So the AIP had and still has an archive and oral history effort and a speaker series, which is essentially the, the, the model for the history of genomics program. So I essentially appropriated what the AIP was doing and then put it to the um, history genomics program that I now co-manage with Brittany Kish. So they have a significant archive. I've had an oral history program going since the 1950s. They have conferences, uh, they have computational uh, and library resources, um, all of it. And I basically borrowed all that to, to, to bring to the NIH. And this was my first job as a historian, even though it was in is it's in physics because I'm fascinated by mathematics and I'm fascinated by science generally. So this was one of the first sort of computational studies where we used the publicly available biographies of physicists to develop essentially network models um, and informational displays, which basically looked at in connections between institutions, persons, and committee assignments. Uh, and it was uh, a very uh, early grant funded by the NSF to do this kind of you know, computational work, which has then been integrated into um, the, uh, the library resources at the Niels Bohr Library. Now, why I became a historian of biology and genetics uh, was not only because of my dissertation, it was because of my work um, with um, Frank Portugal uh, uh, working on a book on Marshall Nuremberg and the, the Paul U experiment, which essentially elucidated or tried to elucidate some features of the central dogma uh, between uh, DNA and proteins um, and, and amino acids. Um, and this really sort of, uh, even though I was working on a, a genetics, uh, a history of genetics dissertation, I really, again, uh, had the opportunity to do this work and was really fascinated by molecular biology and, and really decided to if I was ever going to, to be a you know, historian, it really was going to be a historian of biology and, and genetics. So in 2012, um, as I was finishing my PhD, um, we, I had the opportunity through the, uh, the intervention of, of Larry Thompson to begin something called the History of Genomics Program. And in 2012 and 2013, this was mostly an archival effort. Um, so we now have uh, uh, over a million pages of archival materials from the entire history of the Human Genome Project, dating even back to the to the late '80s or even the mid '80s with the DOE and some other individuals, individual institutions, um, and then the uh, going basically into into basically the present. Um, and this is again a unique archive. It's totally digital, and we have uh, thirty or something. Um, uh, uh, connections and uh, affiliations with outside institutions who uh, are able to do work in our archives. But by 2013 and 2014, we also started developing, or I started developing a unique oral history program because lots of uh, uh, folks were retiring and lots of programs were, were changing. And um, we have one of the most robust oral history programs on the NIH campus, and they continue to um, uh, to be produced, and um, they've been sort of an amazing resource for, for scholars and staff through the years. In addition to this, we have really important symposia. So um, uh, about two years ago, we had 
an important symposium on, on disability and genomics. And we just had a, a very important discussion on the many uh, dimensions of sex and gender in the genomic era. So um, as I've said, um, I've sort of become a, a, a contemporary historian of, of biology and genetics, rooted a little bit in physics. I've been working in archives for, for 20, you know, 20 or so years. Um, and this just presents an amazing opportunity. And all of this is part of the History of Genomics program, which is still a unique program on the NIH campus, which um, really uh, uh, is, is uh, the only program embedded in an NIH institute. It is also the only program which I think really uh, interrogates these difficult questions, some of which, uh, including the interactions between genetics and eugenics, um, which I think um, is a really unique perspective uh, for an institute to have. So moving towards uh, our uh, ma the major lecture for today, which is the history of eugenics and its complex connections between uh, eugenics um, and genetics in the 20th century, uh, the lecture objectives are to really understand what eugenics is and how it's connected with ableism and scientific racism in the 20th century to better understand recent manifestations of eugenics, scientific racism, ableism, and heteronormativity, to compare these instances to other, uh, to compare sort of more modern instances to other instances of eugenics, both during and after the Second World War, to acknowledge uh, the role of the NIH in promoting ableism and eugenic ideology, and this is actually throughout the 20th century, and to detail the role of geneticists in combating eugenics. So I don't want to unfairly single out um, geneticists. I don't want to unfairly single out any scientists uh, or even a number of bioethicists that I'm going to talk about because there has always been a kind of countercurrent uh, by geneticists and, and by, uh, by researchers to combat genetics very forcefully. And I think this is important because there is no necessary connection between genetics and eugenics and scientists have always understood that. But to think about a little bit uh, to, to move out uh, is to thinking about just the roots of eugenic thinking. And eugenics is at its basis. Uh, it's underscored that there are two types of individuals. And you can see this in the, the cartoon of the, the stork with you have sort of the, the prim proper stork uh, and then sort of the over the overloaded storks with the sort of masses of people. So this is an ideology which basically says there are two broad types of individuals, the fit and the unfit in the modern civilization, which the cartoon is, is trying to, to exemplify, uh, and that population increases were really undoing the work of, of natural selection and of nature. This meant that, similar to the picture above, far fewer than the right sort of people were being born. And it's often the case, concerns about fitness and population, uh, like in the cartoon, uh, were deeply racialized while bound up in notions of class and disability. So eugenics is then at its root, um, is the idea that modern science, um, modern society, um, especially but not exclusively genetics, provides a way of, of solving these difficult questions with ease. So I, I just want to, to acknowledge that uh, Francis Galton, who was um, Darwin's half-cousin, was one of the sort of early promoters, if not the founder of eugenics. Um, and uh, and he has a, a significant outsized role. He was also one of the founders of statistical science. But I want to focus less on, on what he said about eugenics for the moment and really emphasize sort of what it means. And this is a definition of eugenics from the leading scholar uh, or among the leading scholars of, of eugenics and scientific racism, my friend and colleague, Marius Torda uh, from Oxford, where Mari, uh, Marius says, and I quote, eugenics became an influential scientific uh, theory used by physicians, health experts, religious leaders, and politicians across the political spectrum to express their understanding of human and social evolution. Physical and intellectual achievements, it was, was assumed, were determined by heredity. To control heredity, eugenicists claimed, was to ensure the betterment of future generations and their survival of, uh, of species. Another popular claim put forward during the first half of the 20th century 
was that modern society was under constant threat from those with physical and mental disabilities. Eugenicists wanted to prevent those people from having children. So not only is it about racism and control and surveillance and the abuse of science, it's also about these ableist uh, rhetorics. And broadly, there are two kinds of, of eugenics and apologies for the duplicate slide. So there's negative eugenics. Uh, and we'll, by the way, see a, a number of geneticists and a number of bioethicists and a number of scientists through the 20th century talk about both kinds of eugenics. So there's negative eugenics, which includes sterilization, involuntary confinement, and involuntary confinement. This was this was made to, to reduce the numbers of, of unfit. So when we have people like Charles Davenport, this is what they really mean. There's also positive eugenics, which means that we're not trying to reduce the number of, of unfit individuals. We're trying to increase the number of quote unquote fit individuals. So this is very pronatalist. Um, there are things like um, having so-called baby bonuses or family allowances, where if you have sort of over three or so children, you get, you get more money. Um, so this is straight positive eugenics, and um, this was to, quote unquote, improve the stock of the race. And one of the key promoters of this sort of ideology was this idea uh, of, uh, was uh, was R.A. Fisher, uh, Fisher, who, again, was one of the founders of the modern science of statistics, and, and uh, particularly uh, was uh, a, a key proponent of this kind of positive eugenics. Um, on the other hand, many eugenicists promoted both kinds. Um, and I'm not going to read from the text on the right, but just uh, this is H.H. Uh, Goddard, who we'll also encounter in the, in the slides later on. Um, this was this is a, a, a sort of typical example of, of negative eugenics, thinking about involuntary um, in, involuntary confinement. Uh, and also involuntary sterilization, particularly around individuals who are labeled as disabled. And just to be clear, what what does it mean? Uh, what was the eugenics movement in essence after? And the ideal type of the eugenics movement is is really emphasized by this picture. Um, and this is from the the second uh, International Eugenics Conference Congress proceedings. Uh, in 1921, and this was a series of conferences that we'll encounter again um, that was um, uh, promoted and housed in the American Museum of Natural History, which the museum has done a great deal to, uh, to basically reconcile and also acknowledge uh, its role in. But again, uh, this was, a, I think, a, a statuette uh, pro produced by uh, Charles Davenport's uh, wife, Jane. And Davenport, as some of you know, was the head, uh, was one of the founders in the American eugenics movement, who we'll encounter a little later. But it's this idea of, of sort of this white, typical male. He looks, um, to my eyes, uh, uh, you know, reasonably sort of Northern European. Also, there's this there's this Greek or classical sort of archetype that's that's um, that's moderating here. So uh, th this is a this is very synonymous with this racialized, very normative in terms of sex and gender, very normative in terms of proportion, very normative in terms of lack of disability or so-called blemish. And this is essentially the ideal type that the uh, eugenics movement wanted more of. So before I go into uh, uh, some of the American aspects, um, I just want to give a sort of an overview of the, of the changing continuities and discontinuities of eugenic ideology, uh, focusing not only on the, the first part of the 20th century, but even going into the second and sort of giving us a preview of what I'm going to talk about in the second part of the talk. So here's William Bateson, who is one of the founders of, of basically modern genetics and was a key sort of promoter of Mendel and Mendelism. Um, and here, I think uh, it's only to say that many people have said that that um, uh, Bateson did not hold eugenic beliefs or was skeptical of the eugenic movements. But you can see by these very quotes that he not only, uh, even if he sort of uh, 
uh, backed off against some of the more excessive uh, variants of some of what Davenport and others were saying, he very much tried to weaponize disability, and he also tried to, we to weaponize any role of state governance, particularly using scientific principles. And he also had a deeply racialized view of society. And this is from his Galton lecture of, of 1919. So I focus here on Moyen, who was a Norwegian geneticist, just really to emphasize very quickly Again, that eugenics through most of the 20th century was, was not only an animated by de dehumanizing accounts of disability, but also paranoid fears of race, so-called race mixing and deterioration. So when he talks about disharmonic race uh, crossings in this quote, um, and here you see him sort of with his beloved hairs. These are his; these were his models for crosses. Um, you see this deep anthropological weaponization of, of human bodies, but also a lot of the anxieties around migration and and class and race uh, around um, and this sort of the use of genetics to try to qual uh, quantify all of these things. Um, and uh, th this is where, you know, uh, and it goes back to to 19th century ver uh, discussions around uh, that you see in, in naturalist, uh, naturalist texts around so-called hybrid vigor and all this nonsense, which is uh, something I'm not going to talk about too much, but it really animates much of genetics in the 20th century as well. And, and lastly, uh, two quotes from James Neal or Jim Neal. Um, and I, uh, or lastly, from geneticists. And here I want to emphasize that Neil's writings, for me, underscore a number of points. In the first instance, the above quote is a is a is a clear summary that both kinds of eugenics, even after the Second World War, were were uh, promoted and defended. Um, in the second instance, Neil was an extraordinarily talented geneticist, and he was an extraordinarily talented mathematical statistical genesis. So he should know that uh, it's it's difficult to perturb in any um any sort of phenotypic uh, 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 phenotypic variation in in a population and that eugenics should have been impossible and was unethical. but he decided to promote it anyway and he had done some of the math. Um, and third, that his writings, even in the 1990s, this is in his uh, letter to Ken Weiss, who's an anthropologist um, at um, uh, Penn State, um, it, and it is courtesy of the American Philosophical Society, that that even in the, the 1990s, uh, Neil uh, was still promoting kind of a, a vision of eugenics and as population control, which use which uses different vocabulary, but you still see some of the continuities and some of the paranoias uh, uh, from the from the sort of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So a merging of the old and the new eugenics, so called, after the Second World War. And the last quote is from Joseph Fletcher, who is a bioethicist and theologian. And I'm not going to again read you the whole quote. But I just want to emphasize, too, that Fletcher's quotation is not only found in The Atlantic, which is a, 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 a widely read publication even today, but it really underscores the depth of ableism and its connection to eugenics, and also the longevity and barbarity of, of that ableism, where even in, you know, in the, uh, the, 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 the tail end of the 1960s, when the Holocaust and the Nazi race state were well known, um, you still have individuals of, of stature making these claims. So to go back a little bit, I just want to answer some really fundamental questions. So was Charles Darwin, who was the, one of the founders of evolutionary science, responsible for eugenics? No, but Darwinism, the name of Darwin, the idea of, of natural selection was, was, was weaponized and then it sort of applied very brutally to society. And that many of his family members, including uh, Major Darwin, were really responsible for the promotion of, of eugenics. Was Gregor Mendel responsible for eugenics? No, but Mendelism was. So like Darwin, uh, Mendel did not live to see the dawn of the eugenic era, but um, uh, Castle, who was a, a very well-known geneticist, was an arch-Mendelian um, and really used uh, Mendel's work to promote 
his view of eugenics. And also David Starr Jordan was, was very keen uh, on, on thinking about how societal problems like, like pauperism and criminality could be, um, and anxieties over over war and conflict could be you could be seen through a eugenics lens, um, uh, uh, using the the work of not only uh, Darwin but also Mendel, and to but to think a little bit more about the the American eugenics movement, we have here um, uh, Charles Davenport, who was a really important figure for our history. So in in 1910, he founded the Eugenics Record Office. And he appointed Harry Laughlin, who we'll see in a, in a few moments, to direct it. So from Davenport's standpoint, um, their, uh, Mendel's work was incredibly powerful, and it was a, a needed resource to understand heredity. And for, for, uh, for Davenport, uh, heredity and eugenics were intermixed and, and uh, continuous. So Davenport uh, was, uh, was very much a Mendelian. And he believed that um, uh, that uh, men, uh, that Mendel's that Mendel's science provided the key to solving uh, a, a, a number amount of a, a number of social problems, including uh, what he believed uh, to be the ever increasing numbers of disabled individuals, the so-called feeble-minded. Where uh, it's very clear in all of Davenport's works that uh, there is a weaponization of intellectual and um, developmental disability, and that uh, eugenics was a way for Davenport and his, uh, his fellow travelers to think about broad social problems connected to uh, these, these broad uh, paranoid notions of, of fit and unfit. So with Davenport used Mendel um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to weaponize disability, but he also, as my colleague uh, Rana Hogarth points out, uh, really weaponizes uh, race where a lot of Davenport's work, particularly in Jamaica, uh, was towards this idea, this weaponization of things like so-called racial mixing and interracial marriage, where that part of Davenport's uh, legacy is still being, I think, um, elucidated in really profound ways. But all of this is to say that in the American eugenics movement, there is um, uh, an early focus on disability. And uh, with, with Davenport, uh, much of eugenics was concerned with, the, you know, as with Goddard, much of eugenics was concerned with a weaponized, weaponized account of disability. Uh, Goddard was actually the, the, the research director of, of a school in, in Vineland, New Jersey, called at that point the Training School for Feeble-Minded Boys and Girls. Um, and uh, Go uh, Goddard was uh, really one of the, the key sort of movers of, of research, of the research in quotation that really sort of promoted this eugenic ideology. And also of the, the of eugenic sterilization of the disabled. So we have Harry Lachlan, uh, who was mentioned in the slide of, of uh, discussing Davenport, really discussing in, in brutal detail, not only a sort of weaponization of, of disability, a weaponization of so-called criminality, a weaponization of fitness and unfitness and, and a weaponization of, of Mendelian genetics, but also um, thinking, thinking about sort of this broad scale program of eugenic sterilization that, uh, that ended up being uh, bar uh, that ended up being a barbaric program for, uh, tens of thousands of people up through the 1960s. And all of this, I think, uh, is leads to a key question of, of who was carrying favor with Davenport and Lachlan? So what was the influence? Or were, or were these individuals sort of simply fringe, um, uh, uh, fringe researchers? And it turns out that the the uh, public health service, which is sort of the the umbrella organization to the the NIH, uh, were we were in close th that organization was in close contact uh, with Davenport and Lachlan during the 1930s. So Lawrence Kolb, who you see uh, in a, a letter, uh, writing a letter to 
uh, to uh, the, uh, this, basically the, the Surgeon General talking about his uh, invitation from Davenport to the third International Eugenics Conference, was one of the founders of addiction medicine, but he also was deeply involved in the early eugenics movement where in particular he sent Davenport and Lachlan his studies on immigrants, which basically used so-called intelligence to distinguish between good and bad immigrants from a from a from a eugenic standpoint. Uh, Kolb um, in the 1950s was also part of the mental health uh, of the mental hygiene and institutionalization movement, and you can see a lot of echoes of his early sort of. Uh, work in the eugenics movement and his later focus on addiction medicine, uh, and uh, as well as his obsession with many individuals in the 1950s over so-called juvenile delinquency. So here is a letter from Lachlan uh, extolling the merits of of Kolb's research as part of the you know public health service. And I put his research in quotations. So Lachlan, who you just saw sort of uh, promoting this, you know, this broad program of eugenics and this broad program of involuntary serialization is 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 in sort of deep correspondence and deep agreement with with Kolb as a you know representative of the American government in the 1930s. And because many individuals um, in the eugenics movement believed, that there was absolutely nothing wrong with anything that they were doing and were firmly uh, uh, sort of uh, firm in their beliefs, we have um, uh, col uh, copies of Kolb's diorama. And this is an actual display from the Third International Eugenics Conference at the American Museum of Natural History in 1933, um, where you actually see sort of his grouping of in immigrants according to uh, uh, intelligence, so-called intelligence, and this sort of promotion of eugenic ideology um, in, in, uh, as part of this conference. So with all that said, I also want to say that the eugenics movement was, was international. So here you have the work of Vladislav Ruzicka in, in Czechoslovakia talking about heredity in man and health and disease. This was published in 1970, uh, 17, and this was sort of deeply Mendelian and, and deeply sort of indebted to the work of Davenport. And this is also to say too that um, the work of Davenport, Lachlan, um, and uh, uh, who, uh, other people that we're going to encounter like Ghostney uh, were uh, deeply, um, uh, deeply informed uh, uh, eugenics and sterilization and even euthanasia campaigns in, uh, in Nazi Germany, uh, where Stefan Kuhl quite uh, uh, controversially, but I think is, is generally correct in saying that there were deep connections where a lot of the American eugenics movement, a lot of the stance of the American eugenics movement towards involuntary sterilization of disabled individuals, its racialization really provided some uh, blueprints to Nazi Germany and its radicalization of, of sort of this race state into the Holocaust. And in many ways, the, the, this was really reinforcing because Scientific American and, and Ghostney actually uh, sort of uh, parroted um, uh, sort of Nazi propaganda uh, as part of sort of scientific literature. Uh, and actually, you can unfortunately still still download all this stuff. It's still available. But this Siam piece that I'm showing on the right and on the left is probably Nazi propaganda, and it really shows the the the, the linkages between the first movements uh, between these two movements. So Ezra Ghostney pictured uh, founded this the something called, uh, organization called the Human Betterment Foundation, and this until 1942 not only supported involuntary eugenic sterilization, but actually engaged in sort of research in quotation marks of the benefits of this, particularly of Cal the California, um, uh, particularly in California. The, the Human Betterment Foundation, uh, as will be illustrated in a later slide, actually uh, became a part of an umbrella group of organizations which began promoting voluntary associate, uh, voluntary sterilization. And this is where the work of, uh, uh, and sort of the ideology of Medora Bass, who will, uh, who will encounter and later in the presentation is, is so important because it actually shows the deep connections between the involuntary sterilization here and so-called voluntary sterilization in the post-war period. 
Um, and such an article was really remarkable, considering that in 1933, just a year earlier, the Nazi government uh, promoted the promulgated the law, the so-called law for the prevention of progeny with hereditary diseases. And all of this is to say, and I'll, uh, I unfortunately have to be a little quick here, that all of this discussion of sterilization and, and weaponization of disability had deep and profound consequences. And, and um, one just one example is, is the Carrie Buck case, where by 1927, as is clear from the testimony of A.S. Pretty, who is the superintendent um, of the, of the so-called state colony for epileptics and the feeble-minded, um, uh, that uh, in, in essence, by 1927, uh, Pretty uh, can essentially say that um, individuals uh, like Carrie Buck uh, can be uh, uh, forcibly sterilized against their will because, as Pretty says, the teaching and experience of all authorities on mental uh, defectiveness and heredity are the basis for my belief. So at this point in 1927, eugenics and this weaponization of, of fitness and unfitness and this weaponization of heredity and this weaponization of disability is, is so endemic that it essentially can be seen as, as, a, as a broad consensus. Um, and here too, you have individuals like Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, who is able in, in, in the context of, a, of, a, of a, a, an established court case to, to say, you know, and I'll just read the last part of the quotation because this gives you a sense of the, of the depth of sensibility and the depth of ideology before the Second World War of, of eugenics and its related ideologies and of the weaponization of, of individuals where um, uh, Holmes uh, is able to say, and I quote, it is better for the world if, if instead to uh, if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for a crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are uh, manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. And it's worth also pointing out that this law is still on the books and has never been officially overturned. Um, so, the, uh, and all of this is to say that that the ideology of eugenics is is uh, even by the pre-war period an essential feature of American law, and it's an essential feature of American society, which has barbaric uh, and irreversible consequences for tens of thousands, not only in terms of sterilization, uh, but also in terms of involuntary confinement and stigma and and sort of this this weaponization of genetics. So you see uh, in the left uh, 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 picture sort of the 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 ubiquity of of some kind of of eugenic sterilization. So I believe the first um, uh, uh, eugenic sterilization. Uh, 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 legislation was in 1907. So by 1913, it was really sort of quite widespread across the United States. Um, and it, it really uh, it continued to be uh, a, a fundamental feature of, of American, of sort of American state law. Um, and on the left, I, 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 or on the right, I just want to emphasize uh, this little snippet, which is from a report, uh, a health and Human Services report, which is uh, titled Research Involving Those Institutionalized as Mentally Infirm, um, that uh, bioethicists, scientists are still struggling, even in uh, 1978 or the, the, the early 80s even, uh, over sort of uh, what is the picture of uh, the legal picture, the social picture, uh, are people still being sterilized against their will? Are people being institutionalized against their will? What does it mean for there to be voluntary sterilization? What does it mean for there to be consent in many of these issues, instances? And this is well beyond the Second World War and has to do with all of the discussions that we're, we've been having over the course of, of this part of the talk. But then it's really just talking, uh, just setting up the legacy of, of post-war discussions of this a sort of very, um, uh, very deep, but also very disturbing sort of trend in American history. So I'm happy to take any of your questions. So, okay. 
I had a question about Lachlan, because I think the slide that you had that information on, you passed it really quickly. So I was just wondering what that was in reference to. Because so, the next, like Goddard and Laughlin, but I didn't quite catch what Laughlin was responsible for. Okay, so let's see here. So, okay, so so Laughlin was in in many ways. So if, if Davenport was the was the geneticist or the biologist, right? So if he was really trying to study this from a research perspective, what Lachlan was was tasked to do was was essentially per, uh, develop eugenics into a practical program, and that included um, not only eugenic sterilization but also um, in involuntary involuntary confinement of those sort of labeled unfit or those labeled disabled or those whom society, according to this eugenic program, did did, did not want to to prosper or, or reproduce. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Donahue, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Um, one of the things that's been striking me is the countries that you've talked about. So America, Germany, and Czech. I'm curious if you know if other countries have struggled with this issue one, for example, I thought of maybe they haven't because immigration in those countries hasn't necessarily been a problem for it to come up. But in your work and in your research, have you seen other countries struggle with this issue? Yes, um, pretty much every single country had a eugenics movement. Mm -hmm. um, every single country um, had a eugenics movement that in some way also after sort of the 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 break or the caesura of the second world war continued that eugenics movement um in um uh, in a in a sort of in a in a, in a redone or just re sort of revamped way but with essential continuities a lot of my work tries to think about these very complex international connections um, in in informed ways. So, for example, just like in the United States, there's a deep connection between the post-war eugenics movement in uh, Sweden and Norway and Finland and and the welfare state. Right. So um, there is a there is a really significant uh, 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 post-war. Uh, eugenic movement, as there is a pre-war eugenic movement in the so-called um, sort of the the Nordic Nordic countries, right? So um, there are uh, there is a significant eugenics movement in in places like uh, places like Poland, uh, the former Yugoslavia, even even Russia. So um, so one of the most interesting historical, or I'd say interesting in quotes. So Dubjansky, who we'll meet later in the slides, his advisor uh, was uh, 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 Philip Chinko was uh, the founder of the eugenics movement in Russia. Uh, and by 1929 and 1930, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, that that movement was was sort of suppressed for complicated reasons. But um, there is a, a significant eugenics movement for about ten years in in um, in, in basically uh, uh, in Russia. Um, there is a significant movement um, of eugenics. Um, uh, throughout the 20th century in in Latin America and South America as well. So yeah, this is a big a, a big uh, 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 sort of I I area of research for a lot of very talented scholars and Italy too. Sorry if that's a little too much information, but that's a great question. That's helpful. Okay, go. I I see a hand up from Gustavo. So please go ahead, and I I hope I. I'm referring to you correctly. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Christopher, for the presentation. So I want to hear your opinion or maybe your thoughts regarding the um, the aspect related on the considering that this is a healthy environment in which we can, we can discuss scientifically and then from the perspective of history. Uh, so the, regarding the concept of a of 
what what is gene therapy and then um uh so many people scientific and good pro vaccine uh, advocates and and people from the you know layman terms or or whatever um they say that the vaccination vaccine was a gene therapy so some of the measures that the DOD Department of Defense took with some of the uh, of the people um that we're working at the very beginning uh, could be considered like a uh, process of eugenetics and uh, they were confined, they were kept uh, uh, and then isolated. So I, I, I just want to hear your perspective yeah. on that and how the history is going to be <laughs> like like uh, analyzing us like later. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I think this is a question we can also talk about too in the, the post the, the second Q&A, but I can answer it a little bit provisionally where I think fundamental trust in science, fundamental trust in the power of genetics, fundamental trust in the in, in cl clinical encounter and clinical study and and uh, you know and of things like precision medicine, those are incredibly transformative. Uh, but a, like a lot of amazing things have a history which i think needs to be acknowledged that that doesn't mean that that the the, the science which benefits so many people and is so transformative is discarded or should be but it it means that in order to build trust which in many instances for many communities is is in short supply or has been lost, there needs to be an acknowledgement and, and there needs to be a discussion about just these kinds of issues. And that ne discussion needs to be open, detailed, honest, and, and transparent. Um, and part of this means you need to be able to do the research, right? And I, I benefit from the fact that I'm able to go into these archives. I'm able to, to you know, go to these archive trips. I'm able to have a director, Eric Green, who supports my work. I'm able to have these frank conversations with scientists in a variety of forums where many of these individuals, the, the, particularly of these slides that I'm going to show you, these are the mentors of people working now, and I'm able to have these frank conversations. And I think that's what we need to have. Okay, so. Hi. Um, I had a question. Just going back when you were speaking about immigration and about good and bad immigrants, I just want to know your thoughts on, like, do you believe, like, like till this day, like those studies about what makes an immigrant good or bad has implications in how we view immigration today? Yes. Um, so I, I should also emphasize that when I say, you know, the, these studies, these studies are it's basically junk science, right? And it's junk science then and it's junk science now. Um, I think there's there's two ways of answering your question. I think there is a broad um, general current of, of looking at good and, and bad immigrants that I think still has eugenic resonances, right, in a, in a general sense that I think is problematic. I also, I also know that these studies are, are specifically still cited by the alt-right and, and, and neo-Nazi elements on the internet and where these kinds these kinds of studies, so from cold and others through something called behavior genetics, which is this effort to um, uh, basically use genetics and basically to to very naively tie genetic studies to to big phenotypic patterns or big phenotypic sort of expressions. Um, there is a specific continuity where you go from, and it's not just cold, it's, it's many, many others. You go through things like intelligence testing, you go through thing, the, the weaponization of immigration, you go through the weaponization of, of foreign and native born, you go through many of these things through to the, to the alt-right, and that's a, that's a definite continuity. So this legacy is still very much, much with us in, in both senses. Unfortunately. Okay, so do we have any any other questions? I th I think um, we have maybe one more minute. 
Chris, this is Larry. And I'm, since it's quiet, I'll take the prerogative of using that minute. You you and I have discussed the the math, right? And and you right. met Jim Neal, and this is my fundamental attack on eugenics when the math is wrong. Right. You mentioned Jim Neal late, and we've talked about his private letters. Did did he get the math and still thought it was a good thing? Which is and what for those of you that don't aren't inside Chris in my head, the math is just wrong. Chris said it, you just can't do eugenics for a lot of the traits. You can't even do it for the Mendelian traits, especially the recessive ones. Right. Because the math doesn't work out. And the, and the easiest way to think of this is that for 10,000 years, no one with cystic fibrosis has ever reproduced. And we still have the allele frequency is still pretty high because of the math problem. Um, so did Jim really get the math that he was, the math was wrong and still think it was worthwhile? Yes, um, and I think uh, because he was so like Stern, he understood like Kurt Stern, he understood the math, but it was more of a let's be safe than sorry posture, and it was it was also just around his particularly in, by the nineties his paranoia's around sort of deforestation, the the so called population bomb, and and sort of this fear of overpopulation and uh, losing sort of uh, uh, having the uh, sort of the human population evolve in a way that that uh, Neil thought was undesirable. So it's it's complicated, but I think he understood the math, but he uh, decided to promote some form of eugenics throughout his career. Even, anyway, even though he had people like Newton Morton, arguing with him constantly about it. And Newton Morton, there's a there's a really striking exchange where, where Morton, uh, where Neil gets so frustrated with Morton over Neil's advocacies, advocacy of eugenics that Neil basically says, okay, I won't call it eugenics, we'll call it something else, but I still believe in it. And, and this is in a, in a conference proceeding. Um, so it, re I mean, they really understood the math. They understood that it was not practical. They understood in some ways that it was unethical, but they, they, they still, because of this paranoia over, you know, environment and overpopulation, uh, among other things, believed it to be necessary, particularly as a, as a future tense thing. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. No problem. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Um, and this is more of the research part of the talk where a lot of this is is not quite, um, uh, you know, not quite as dogmatically or, or summarily known where there's still aspects of this that I'm researching. So eugenics after the Second World War uh, was really dependent on 20th century notions of race. And race is mediated by by uh, genetics and and social structure. So it wasn't this um, uh, vulgar Aryanism or vulgar notions of of inferiority or superiority, uh, but it was still uh, 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 there was still a notion of race that I think was was active. Um, and what I mean by the first point is. Um, even in the work of Dobjansky and Lewontin, there's an undercurrent where they say that there are that racial groups exist, but there is essentially too much of a of a discussion on on pure and so called so called pure and so called continental races. Um, so for Lewontin and Dobjansky, race essentially becomes more complicated. It it doesn't become unmoored from biology and it doesn't become any less sort of problematic and, or reductive. Um, in the post-war period, there's much more of an emphasis on voluntary sterilization. And I put that in quotes because it's not clear what voluntary is in a lot of these instances and where the use of social stigma becomes a, a very common trope. Uh, a very common way of eugenics to 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 be implemented. So eugenics, by its proponents, geneticists and bioethicists, was viewed as an individual expression of autonomy and genetic duty. So individuals who were were carriers or individuals who thought they had some condition running in their family should, according to Paul Ramsey and others, seek out um, uh, sort of eugenic sterilization or or elect not to have children. Um, 
So uh, with ableism, with the kind of weaponized notion of race, there's fears of overpopulation and, and so-called differential reproduction. So what by differential reproduction, I mean um, basically that individuals, depending on uh, social and class circumstances, will, ha will have more children rather than less. Um, and differential reproduction is often used to weaponize individuals in the so-called global south. Um, so with that, there's also much stronger arguments from geneticists on the so-called scientific nature of genetics, of eugenics, its close connections with this, with population and medical genetics, and also eugenics is, is future tense as well. Um, so it's often uh, viewed as it's becoming scientific and, and we just need to improve it and therefore we'll implement it into the future. Um, in the post-war period, I would say, and this is a scholarly claim of mine, that there, there was an even closer connection between eugenics and the sort of the very uh, significant developments in medical and population genetics after the Second World War, and also within uh, with medicine and genetic counseling. So up until the 1980s, uh, genetic counseling was sometimes called eugenic counseling, and this is because of its roots in sort of this eugenic paradigm. But ableism and dehumanization uh, really remain constants, and this is what I want to to emphasize too. So, just pointing out that that uh, Sheldon Reed, uh, and this is the individual on the left, was one of the most outstanding and prominent human geneticists, and he was actually one of the founders of genetic counseling. He actually coined the term genetic counseling, but he actually used many of Davenport's old materials from the the Cold Spring Harbor, and he found them, uh, you know, sort of quite quite useful. And in his discussion of um, so-called feeble-mindedness and, and, and mental retardation. Uh, th those are his terms, uh, not mine. He was lauding the sort of the genius of Davenport um, in ways that I think for, for people that, that know about his legacy and is important to medical genetics is really striking. Um, and he was an avid publisher of sort of this new kind of reestablished eugenics after the Second World War, which was viewed as, quote unquote, more scientific and really thought of, of backing away from many of the excesses of, of Nazi racism and, and is sort of state-sponsored sterilization. But one of the key sort of promoters of, of eugenics in the 20th century, uh, and this is in his book, uh, Mankind Evolving from 1964, uh, was Theodosius Dobzhansky. So Dobzhansky was instrumental um, in developing the, the modern synthesis, but he was also deeply concerned uh, with uh, many uh, so-called deleterious mutations, which were accumulating according to Dobzhansky, according to the progress, because of the progress of modern civilization and modern medicine. So Dobzhansky, as well as Kurt Stern, who we'll, who we'll meet in another slide, uh, was very uh, concerned about sort of heterozygous uh, carriers, heterozygous for a kind of defect, in the words of Julian Huxley. And really, even though he was very aware of the natural state of variation, very uh, uh, very skeptical of, of older notions about superiority and inferiority, was also uh, very strong in his promotion that, uh, and I'm just going to quote here, uh, where he, Dobchansky says in, in 1964, persons known to carry serious hereditary defects ought to be educated to realize the significance of the fact, or they are likely to be, uh, be persuaded to refrain from reproducing, if they are likely to be persuaded to refrain from reproducing their kind, or if they are not mentally competent to reach a decision, their segregation or sterilization is justified. So even though Dobzhansky was one of the founders of the modern science of genetics, he still believed because of the changing nature of civilization, the numbers of individuals who were carriers who were surviving or individuals who uh, would otherwise have passed away if not for modern medicine, he firmly believed in involuntary sterilization and even involuntary segregation in institutions for various individuals. And like many post-war geneticists, he believed that this needed to be something that you convinced 
individuals of, and that this was a clear um, a difference from Nazi Germany, which was very much state imposed. And we see these lines sort of blurring in many ways, but it's worth pointing out that Dobjansky believed this to be kind of an individual persuasion. And this was one of the foundations of, of modern sort of genetic idea, uh, gene uh, eugenic ideology. And we also have even individuals like Francis Crick, who was the, you know, among the founders of uh, uh, biology, um, uh, you know, molecular biology and, and sort of the, uh, the, uh, the modern sort of mo modern science and the, the helical structure of, of DNA. Francis Crick uh, promoted these very utopian schemes where, as you see from his quote, um, he asked, uh, quote, whether it was possible for the government to put something in our food so that nobody could have children. And he continues, and if they could provide another chemical that would reverse the, the effect of the first, and the only people licensed to bear children would be uh, given the second chemical. This is not so wild that we need not discuss it. So Dobjansky uh, promoted involuntary sterilization and, and um, uh, segregation, uh, but uh, for for individuals sort of found to be genetically unfit, but Crick actually moved even further by uh, arguing for this utopian scheme of of governments putting sort of uh, chemicals and, and anecdotes in food to sort of regulate the population. And this is from a conference uh, of the Nobel laureates by the SIBA Foundation. Uh, where uh, 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 in 1963, where the SIBA Foundation, in case you don't know, is actually now Novartis International. So there's there's a legacy of of many of these organizations hosting these early conferences and and then turning into to something else. Um, but I think Crick's uh, Crick's discussion is striking just because of how utopian and how Orwellian. Uh, many of these discussions became from very key people to the history of science and medicine. Um, but I think synonymous with this new sort of uh, the new task of, of eugenics, but also uh, in the in the post-war period, but also synonymous with some continuities in the 1920s and 30s, uh, you have uh, Kurt, the work of Kurt Stern, and Stern uh, was a really pathbreaking geneticist. He was president of the American Society of Human Genetics. He also was one of the founders of, of behavior genetics. And Stern's work even il illustrates that even post-war discussions of uh, variation rather than very simplistic traits, the eugenic discussions still flourished. So for Stern, um, this is in 1962 in an unpublished paper, he would give talks about eugenics pretty constantly. There were two problems. There was the problem of quantity, which was urgent. And this is all about overpopulation. This is all about weaponizing the global South. This is all about differential reproduction and some of the themes that I've been talking about in earlier slides. And also the problem of quality, which he considered to be less urgent, but important nonetheless. This is a quote from Stern papers. So what he believed by that was, you know, in terms of quality was like Dobzhansky and, and like Crick, he believed that because of modern medicine, because of modern civilization, there were too, too many individuals who had, uh, uh, who were born, who had quote, admittedly deleterious genetic constitutions. And, you know, uh, Stern was a was a bright geneticist, so he, he really thought that it was, but he nonetheless thought it was possible that eugenics could be used to, quote, upgrade populations in regard to neural variation. So you see here, even in the 1960s, there's a shift away from some of the older eugenic rhetoric into, away from Mendelian sort of traits into this problem of, of uh, sort of variation, but it's eugenics nonetheless. Um, so we don't have things like criminality, but we do have things like deleterious genetic constitutions and discussions of upgrading, you know, with regard to the normal or baseline variation. It's also worth pointing out that um, uh, that uh, Prince uh, that Princeton was actively engaged with the American Eugenic Society, which was the uh, society that uh, uh, where that that first um, slide of of the tree that I showed you, that's an American Eugenic Society publication. So 
the uh, Princeton throughout most of the 1960s uh, sought to to merge sort of the the still existing movement of eugenics into the not only the best and brightest of the scientific community, but the best and brightest of, of genetics. Um, so and that's population and medical genetics and studies of behavior and studies of social structure, where even with the acknowledgement of not the Nazi horrors and the Holocaust, there was still a dedicated emphasis on the part of the eugenics movement and a broad understand uh, a broad acceptance of eugenic premises by a number of geneticists that there was an effort, an institution, university wide effort, and it's not just Princeton, to really try to see how eugenics could be scientific, how eugenics could be molded into the new data, how eugenics could be sort of taking uh, the best advantage of the evolutionary synthesis and the, the population genetic studies that were, that were undergoing in this way. So you have Dobzhansky, you have J.P. Scott invited to these conferences. You actually have Richard Lewinton, who is considered to be one of the founders of modern population genetics and a, a key critic of racism and sociobiology, but also he was very keen to engage with these eugenicists in the 1960s, uh, individuals like Richard Osborne. And the goal of this meeting and other meetings was, quote, the redefinition of eugenics, both in relation to theoretical scientific problems and as a practical movement concerned with the application of genetics to human affairs. So it, it was making eugenics scientific, but also saying, just like in the 1930s, 40s, 20s, 10s, how it could be practiced. So with all that, I also just want to emphasize too, to return to some key points. So we have institutions and we have individuals promoting uh, eugenics and promoting the scientific nature of eugenics and its practice, uh, even with the new sort of foundations of uh, genetics. But I also wanna to emphasize too, that there's a there's a fundamental barbarism that still exists with with ableism, the eugenics movement, and even recent human genetics. So this is from uh, page 42 of Human Genetics: Problems and Approaches by Vogel and Matulski, um, where it's uh, it is clear from from the right side of the slide that discussions of feeble mindedness, so called, this weaponized word that was uh, that was uh, so dehumanizing in the early eugenics movement, that is still used in genetics textbooks in the 1980s. Um, this was a common descriptor in medical genetics textbooks uh, until relatively recently. And there's an emphasis too in human genetics in this time between intellectual disabilities, behavior disorders, and specific genes, uh, where Vogel and Matulski's discussion as well really talks a lot about fertility and, and intellectual disability. And those discussions where there's a paranoia about the sort of the reproductive capacity of individuals with intellectual disabilities, this harkens back to not only uh, the 1930s, but it actually is very synonymous with discussions you'll see at the NIH in just a moment. So here we have to acknowledge that the, the NIH played a significant role in the weaponization of, of disability and the weaponization of, of behavior and its supposed genetic uh, contributions. So I've, I've written about this in an article called the complete Y chromosome marks an opportunity to move away from stigma. And that's in Scientific American. That's going to be available at the at the end too. Uh, where there uh, is in the 1970s a frequent association between so-called sex chromosome abnormalities, uh, such as Klinefelter's and, and so-called feeble-mindedness and feminization and lack of initiative, and also in, things like. Um, uh, Jacob's condition uh, with criminality and social behavior, where uh, intellectual disability and genetics show significant racialization in the 1970s and 1980s and paranoid anxieties and weaponi weaponization around masculinity and other traits. And it is important to acknowledge that the seeing the report on the, on the, the right of the slide, that the NIH was uh, responsible for propagating at least some of these some of these myths. So the the uh, so the NIH had a had a clear responsibility to to say that none of these uh, uh, um, studies were scientific. It had been well known that that there was no connection between aggression and a supernumerary Y chromosome, and it chose to take sort of a very intermediate posture. Um, this becomes even more 
uh, problematic when uh, institutions like the NICHD host uh, conferences like the like the above shown here, where the uh, where the HHS and the NICHD really sort of weaponize disability and genetics. And as the quote on the left really shows you, there's not much of a space between the rhetoric that Davenport or Lachlan would would have and um, the the rhetoric that some of the conference goers. Uh, have uh, here in the left, where I think this again, uh, just uh, really, as a, a, an individual asked the question before, really underscores the degree to which uh, the NIH, just like with Kolb, uh, but now in, in the 1970s, really needs to acknowledge that uh, there was a promotion of, of eugenics uh, rhetoric, and also there was even a uh, discussion around practices of involuntary adoption and things like this, where this really needs to be acknowledged, and this was very much pervasive on, on the campus in the 1970s, um, where even um, in 1971, the same center that produced um, the uh, the the study on X Y the X X uh, X Y Y condition and and sort of behavioral abnormalities so called actually funded uh, a, a a book on looking again at the uh, uh, at the feasibility of so called eugenic sterilization um, and we actually have not only the publication but the but the grant number so there's clear evidence that the NIH and the NIMH as well as the NICHD was we're sponsoring clearly um, sort of eugenically tinged or eugenic conferences that uh, tapped into and tried to extend uh, sort of very consistent uh, uh, across the 20th century weaponization around genetics and disability, even though, you know, again, uh, they uh, th this was well beyond the 1940s where, where the uh, Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, all of that was known, but they still tried to in the same way as many other geneticists and biologists at the time, basically saying that, that we have the knowledge now to implement this. And perhaps because of these fears of, of, of uh, disability and overpopulation, eugenic sterilization, even in sort of a very, a very, you know, sort of unvarnished form should be pursued, uh, should be pursued again. But um, thankfully, I want to return to some of the efforts that geneticists have made to combat eugenics. And I think this goes to, to Larry Brody's point, where even by the 1960s, there was a clear sense by um, some of Dubchansky's circle on the part of, of quantitative geneticists, particularly uh, like Isidore Lerner, that the math didn't make sense and that is uh, that genetics that eugenics was unscientific and unsupported by genetics and also totally unethical. So Lerner, and he's, so he's pictured here, he was a poultry geneticist. He was a, a brilliant um, uh, uh, su uh, supporter of, of uh, this concept of genetic equilibrium, where he actually was able to show that, that uh, sort of uh, populations on the genetic level do not change very much, and that there's uh, there's it's very very difficult, sort of in the ter terms of a naturally occurring population, uh, to to essentially shift any kind of phenotype um, uh, one way or the other. And this was the kind of this became neutralism or existed alongside of it. But he noted that um, as we would say today you know, uh, or some version of it. So uh, all of us are carriers on average of, of several detrimental mutations. So he said, all of us are, are uh, have mutations. And in and, and, and many cases, these, you know, these mutations mean very little. But he also says, and I think this is a key quote, this is in a 1968 book on heredity and society. It was actually one of the first genetics and society courses uh, that he used his textbook in. Uh, he says, uh, Lerner says, uh, eugenics based on heterozygous screening on a large on a scale large enough to be of significance would not lead to improvement, but rather termination of mankind on Earth. So he said it would be impossible and unethical. And Lerner also underscored that when we think about eugenic traits that are considered to be good or individuals that are considered to be fit, he went through the history of of eugenics and basically said that all of this tended to be varied and nobody really could make up their mind. 
And what could be fit today could be unfit tomorrow. And I think he provides a really essential resource very, very early against not only the unscientific nature of eugenics, but also it's, it's you know, sort of it's ethical, um, it's sort of uh, ethical abysmalness, um, which is to say um, we should also highlight C.C. Lee, who um, with his present, with his ASHG presidential address in 1961, essentially deconstructed every single stereotype of eugenics, um, uh, from its notions about superiority to its notions about degradation to its notions of of perturbing the sort of genetic heritage, uh, one way or the other. He in this, and I think this really remarkable. Uh, uh, a 1961 presentation to the American Society of Human Genetics uh, really sort of deconstructed all of the uh, the prejudices of eugenics. was was very keen on on calling out individuals uh, of of why they needed um, uh, to to very clearly and very considerately think about their public statements in this regard. Um, and you know, Lee uh, was among my favorite geneticists because he was not only a brilliant population geneticist, he took the opportunity for his presidential address to use that knowledge to combat against much of the ideology that he was seeing with uh, Dubjansky, Stern, and and um, even his benefactor, Hermann Muller, who was, like a lot of individuals, deeply concerned about modern civilization and wanted to have uh, a... a, a program of eugenics and understood the math, but promoted it anyway. So I, I think we should all, you know, sort of uh, read more C.C. Lee, and I think he needs to be more acknowledged in the history of genetics uh, by it, it not, you know, sort of by, not by scientists necessarily, because I, I can't say one way or the other, but by historians have not had a lot of contact with him, and I'm trying to change that. So um, some final thoughts. Uh, on the left are some materials from the, the, the Bass archive at the University of Montana. So Bass was uh, the attendee of at least one major NICHD conference and was frequently cited. So in my view, because of the interconnections between the Human Betterment Foundation that I emphasized or that I underscored or detailed with Gwozny, there needs to be much more of a discussion and a serious discussion between the connections between so-called involuntary sterilization in the pre-war period and post-war voluntary sterilization, and particularly the all the discussions around voluntary sterilization, particularly in the context of intellectual and developmental disability, particularly after Buck v. Bell. Um, and also the NIH role, because at the same time or in the same decade as all of these uh, unbelievably eugenically tinged conferences. Uh, the NICHD was not only th thinking about uh, sort of uh, the, these paranoid connections between uh, reproduction, intellectual disability, and, and fertility, but also actively, uh, actively researching uh, to the tune of millions of dollars uh, the uh, sort of new, new and novel methods of of sterilization, um, and this is a, this is an emphasis with which drops out um, after 1989 or so, and this is an open research question. So on the one hand, you have the NIH in the 1970s and 80s really weaponizing disability, really promoting a eugenics a eugenic program and eugenic practices, and also. Uh, uh, really researching all of these new methodologies around sterilization. And I don't have all the story yet, but it's an open research question for me. So, and the key too of what is voluntary in, in, in this instance where there's a lot of research coming out now, which shows that even in, in the instances of voluntary sterilization, that individuals who are voluntarily sterilized are much more likely to, to uh, be labeled um, as having a disability or disabled. So there's, in the literature, and I think in our common discussion, 
a a a clear uh, understand a clear dichotomy between voluntary and involuntary sterilization. But I think there's a story that is very complicated and needs a lot of nuance about about what does it mean even in contemporary senses. Uh, given the ubiquity of the eugenics, eugenics movement, given its continuities, and what does it mean for there to be voluntary sterilization today, particularly in the context of intellectual and developmental disability? So to end, um, there are, here are some here are some resources. Uh, the first here is the uh, the my interview with the American Medical Association on the history of physicians in the American eugenics movement. The second here on the right is uh, an article by my colleague Rana Hogarth on her book, Medicalizing Blackness, which really looks at um, Davenport's uh, work at Cold Spring Harbor and the, the, the ways in which the eugenics movement really uh, addressed race and these, these paranoid fears of intermarriage and hybridity and uh, intermixing. Um, uh, and I think it's a it's a brilliant book, and um, uh, but you can read uh, Rana's interview to get the, the gist of it. And the third at the bottom is our two day symposium on eugenics and scientific racism from 2022. This entire symposium is um, uh, now available on YouTube, and it gives you a good inter uh, overview of not only the history of eugenics, but also how those legacies are are still active today uh, by some really uh, brilliant people. Um, Marius Torda, Alex Mina Stern, Natalie Lira, and, and some others. So do, don't take my word for it. You should you should watch what they have to say about this very active research as well. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. If I'm not sure how much time we have. Well, you have three questions in the Q and A, Chris. If you oh. they're very good. If you if you I can read them for you if you would like. Yeah, that's that would be good. So the first. First one is, can the screening of potential parents for del deleterious mutations to discourage them from having children be considered a form of eugenics? I think that depends on the context. Um, I would I would really have, it would need to be much more specific. Um, I think in those kinds of discussions, what needs, what, I mean, this is in my, I don't want to sound dogmatic, but um, in my view, as a as someone who's really looked at a lot of this history for a very long time, there just needs to be acknowledgement that this kind of language and this type of scenario was used to promote eugenics in the past, and that without due care and without due reflection, it can be used to to promote eugenics at the present and in the future. Thank you. The next question is. Has any action been taken by organizations such as the WHO to address or change laws related to eugenic sterilization? Um, not that, not that I well. The WHO. That's actually a question that I I would need a little bit of time to think about. Um, I know that this is actually this is not answering your question. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do it because I want to emphasize the work of a good friend and colleague, where Jim Tabory actually got the Utah State Board of Health to apologize for its role in in involuntary sterilization, uh, I believe last year. So I know that there are statewide and um, uh, discussions around rolling back some of the legislation that is still on the books. I know that there is a wide scale effort in many states to think about reparations for involuntary sterilization. I know that many institutions are considering their legacies, even in the case of voluntary sterilization. I know that um, there are many sort of legal frameworks like in, like in Texas with these workhouses, but I actually don't know off the top of my head what the, what the WHO is, is doing at the moment, but I, I can, if I know who asked that question, I can get right back to you. And then finally, um, thanks for your talk. Is there any relationship between eugenic sterilization campaigns to pull er Ehrlich's ideology as presented in his book, Population Brom? Yeah, so this is the this is the Paul Ehrlich book, and the the Paul Ehrlich book 
uh, on the population bomb. And it was not only Ehrlich, but individuals like Garrett Hardin uh, and, and many others. Um, if this provided, uh, th this essentially took a, 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 a movement that was trying to essentially redefine itself because of the Nazi horrors. And it took that book and essentially said, this is one tool that we can use to really promote the necessity of a eugenics program in the present. And also not only the scientific nature of it, but also in most importantly, the ethics of it. Because individuals that I did not discuss like Kingsley Davis, who was a population demographer, basically said that without a program of eugenics, individuals in uh, uh, the global, what we would now call the global South would essentially starve to death. So eugenics was ethical because of they wanted to they wanted to um, uh, sort of um, uh, sidestep this so-called reality. So Ehrlich's book um, really uh, moved into uh, th these kinds of fears and really accelerated them. And from Ehrlich's book, you have uh, it, uh, you have institutions like the Population Reference Bureau, uh, which actually took Ehrlich's sort of uh, uh, discussions and actually tried to su subject them to not only some scientific study, I say that in quotes, but actually promoting that even, you know, on an institutional level. So Ehrlich's book and the work of many ecologists um, were, uh, uh, and population demographers were extremely important. And that's precisely, actually, that that's precisely what Neil is talking about. So when he talks about overpopulation, he's really thinking about Ehrlich's book. Hmm. Those are all the questions in the Q&A currently, so I think we can go back to questions in the room if there are any. Um, I have another question, but I don't know if it's like out of scope, because I was just thinking about with genetic technologies now as we're moving and like in reference to like direct to consumer genetic testing and how there's a lot of discussion about like patients and their understanding of genetics in the sense. I was just wondering like with the language and like the results they receive, like if there is language on like fear mongering about like what they could possibly like their, how do you say, like what um, genetic diseases they could carry and such, if that could be seen in a sense of towards the movement of eugenics and towards the movement of like scaring them into like voluntary sterilization. No, I, I think um, I think that's a concern, and there's a lot of there's a whole history that I didn't talk about, and that would be another presentation, which throughout much of the 20th century, saying this population is more sort of uh, more likely to have this condition, right? So there's a lot of discussion around sort of the medicalization of populations or saying that one population has a greater disease burden than another. Um, and there's also a lot of concerns around the very issues that you raise in, in terms of precision medicine. Um, scholars like Nathaniel Comfort at Johns Hopkins really say that there's a, there's a direct continuity between the eugenics movement and current uh, efforts in precision medicine. I'm skeptical of that uh, in a direct way. I think very sort of consistent with what I've been saying with another with another respondent. I I think there just needs to be an acknowledgement that there needs to be an acknowledgement that an undue emphasis, a deterministic uh, emphasis on genetics as the key to your future and having the perfect constitution and the perfect genotype and the perfect body, that's all eugenics and has been used in the, in the really in the past. And the acknowledgement of the past should not determine our stance towards the present or the future, but it really should inform it. So all of these discussions around precision medicine, around clinical encounter and clinical results and 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 you know all of these communities really thinking about their genetic heritages. I think the for me, the most important is not saying it's it's eugenics or not, but that there needs to be an acknowledgement that eugenics has occurred and is still occurring, and that, that there is always the possibility of this. 
And I think that's it's this it's this sense that uh, this is always th that these types of uh, th that this history is real and that this has been used in the past in a similar way, but that um, I, I wouldn't make a direct connection. I would just say there needs to be acknowledgement of past history and uh, of potentialities. If that's all the questions, I think we can just thank you, Chris, for a really yeah. wonderful talk on a very challenging subject. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks so much for your questions.